Hello there. Welcome to Just the Discs. My name is Brian, and we talk about Blu-rays here. And back by popular demand, well, uh, some comments I got on the previous video where I talked about some classic films uh, from Indicator. Uh, let me know that there are definitely some of you out there that enjoy hearing about classic film. And I get that that's not everybody's bag, so no worries if uh, this isn't for you. But if you are a classic film fan or you're thinking about starting to check out classic film, there's a couple different entry points that are pretty fun. Um, film Noir, definitely one of them. That's a big one I think gets a lot of people. Uh, but another one that I've noticed is pretty popular among the classic film community and might be a good entry point as well is pre-code films, uh, films before the Hayes Code took effect, uh, took hold of Hollywood in a time when things were a little bit racier, a little bit, um, a little bit edgier. Uh, before we went into that production code era, which lasted through basically, I want to say like the late 1960s almost before we broke into the ratings code or the ratings system. Um, but anyway, so there's a lot of pre-code stuff that's coming out like Noir. Um, not as much as Noir, because again, Noir is a little bit more popular, but the pre-code films are fun because they, like I said, can be a little more risque in some senses in terms of what you're used to seeing from films of this period, you know, the 19, early 1930s, you know, up to about 1934. Um, so I have three here, three pre-code pre films, two recent and one that I was just sort of reminded of because of the second one, uh, and I'll get into that in a minute. But um, let me start with a really enjoyable one called If I Had a Million, and this is from 1932. And this one's just a really neat anthology uh, of a bunch of people that get a million dollars. And let me elaborate on that. Um, the opening sequence, the other thing that's really neat about this is it's directed by like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight or nine directors. Each one has a segment or two. And among them are Ernst Lubitsch, Norman Z. McLeod, who directed It's a Gift and some other W.C. Fields stuff. Uh, he does the W.C. Fields segment in this movie. Uh, and Norman Tarog, too, who I like, who does the opening and closing. Um, but yeah, it's it's opening with this rich guy. I don't know the actor um, who's thinking he's dying and he's changing his will over and over again. And then he just decides, you know what, I'm going to give a million bucks to strangers. I'd rather do that than deal with these vultures in my family, blah, blah, blah. So he opens the phone book and starts dripping, I don't know if it's ink or water, on pages and just starts picking names randomly. And he picks like, I don't know, 10 names maybe. And so we see a series of vignettes where you see the phone book entry and it zeroes in on the name and then we cut to whoever it is. Um, and they're all interesting. Some of them are very funny. Some of them are lighthearted. Some go very dark. Uh, there's one with a very young George Raft that goes very dark where he's a bank forger who can't basically the the million dollars is issued in check form so you have to go to a bank but they have a letter that you know says this check is good you can cash this check or you can deposit this check and he can't go into a bank because he's you know been picked up for forgery so he can't get it chat he can't get it deposited and um so it's kind of a sad one and there's a couple others like that. There's one in Death Row. There's some some stuff like that. But my favorites, I think, are The Clerk, which is directed by Ernst Lubitsch, which is a wonderful, sh very sh just like a short, really, uh, with Charles Lawton as a guy who works as a clerk in a l large firm. And we get to see him stick it to his boss. I'm not going to talk about what happens, but it's pretty delightful that it's there's almost no dialogue, I don't think. And it's just a great little short. Um, and then the Norman Z. McLeod, both uh, of his pieces, one of them is called China Shop, and that stars um, the wonderful uh, Charlie, Charlie Ruggles as this guy, this nerdy guy working 
in a China shop who keeps getting his pay deducted because he keeps breaking the China. And he's asking to be transferred back to uh, accounting. And they're like, no, no, accounting's all full. You're fine here, you know. And then, you know, he gets home and his wife's on his case because he broke this China and lost like 11 bucks or something, which I guess is a lot of money in 1932. Um, And then what happens, each of the things is what happens. We sort of sometimes see a setup and then we see what happens when they get the million. So it's very funny to see what Charlie Ruggles does when he gets that million dollars. Uh, And then there's another one called Roadhogs, and that's the one with W.C. Fields where he and his wife, uh, played by, I think, um, oh, shoot, uh, Allison Skipworth. They get a new car and then almost immediately get hit by T-Bone by another car. And as they're in their you know, recovery from the accident and being upset about losing her car. I think he bought it for her or they bought it for her. She gets the money and then they decide to buy a bunch of junker cars and drive around the city with extra drivers um, to try and track down what they call road hogs and drive them off the road, crash their cars, and then, you know, have the drivers pull up and let them switch into another car as they go. They do it like a whole day. Anyway, that's just one example of the fun stuff that happens in this movie. So it's a really enjoyable farcical pre-code film. And I, <clears throat> I had seen, I had taped it off TCM years ago, but then it was like, I don't remember watching it. Like I remember it being something I was like, Oh, that's a cool one. Look at that cast. It should be fun. And I swear I watched it, but I really could not remember all these pieces. Uh, There's some genuine surprises for me. So a really delightful movie and uh, great to have a nice Blu-ray of it. And um, so this is uh, including an audio commentary with one of my favorite filmmakers, Alan Arkush, uh, as well as film historian Daniel Kramer. And uh, I'm delighted to check that out soon. But like I said, oh, I forgot Gary Cooper buried the lead. He's got a little bit in this where he's a Marine uh, and working like on a base or in the um, guardhouse or something and gets arrested for punching a sergeant. And then somebody, the guy, the lawyer that's giving out the checks finds him and he sees it's April 1st. So he doesn't definitely doesn't believe it's a real check. And there's a couple cases where people end up giving away the checks or something happens to the checks and they don't get cash. But anyway, uh, really enjoyable pre-code. Definitely worth your time. Uh, good cast. Totally dug this. Uh, good commentary I'm looking forward to. Next up, we have Counselor at Law, starring John Barrymore. Um, and uh, this one, this one I had seen. I definitely remember this one coming out on DVD back in the days when I was working at the video store. And it was a big deal. Uh, it's directed by William Wyler, which is on the front there. And William Wyler, of course, did movies like Roman Holiday, Ben-Hur, Best Years of Our Lives, um, the heiress. I'm a huge fan of the heiress. Uh, big country, the great western. So he's uh, oh the collector. Yeah, I forgot about that. Um, really solid director, and this is an early effort for him. And it is a really neat movie and a neat showcase for John Barrymore, who I'm definitely a fan of. Uh, Melvin Douglas is also in this, as is Onslow Stevens and Thelma Todd, who I'm a big fan of. She's great. Um, so this one is about sort of a day in the life of this lawyer played by John Barrymore. And we spend most of the time in his office. In fact, I don't think the movie barely steps outside his office. Uh, I mean, there's different rooms in his office, so we're not in the same room the whole time, uh, but it's mostly in his office. And we're seeing sort of his day to day, how, you know, what he's dealing with, what cases he's on, his attitude towards his wife and his kids who he, likes he loves very much but they don't seem to necessarily have the same affection for him um he's i guess apparently a blue collar guy that worked his way up and she's more of a aristocratic um rich type but anyway so you know throughout the course of the day we find out he's got a big problem you know there's a case that went bad on him he did something a little more than a little sketchy that could get him disbarred and there's another i think lawyer that's looking into taking this up with the, um, you know, the, getting him ex- expelled from law, getting him disbarred. And so it's a matter of him kind of panicking and trying to figure out if he's totally screwed or what's going to happen. Um, but it's a really great performance from John Barrymore. He's a 
very specific actor, a great character of a man, and he has a lot of energy. He can be very big, uh, but it works really well with inside this character. Um, I think 20th Century is still probably my favorite John Barrymore performance. He's really, really good um, in that film and it is allowed to go really big as like a theatrical director directed by Howard Hawks. Um, and that's a great uh, Blu-ray from Indicator that you can pick up. Uh, anyway, so this is just a really enjoyable, you know, pre-code. We're dealing with some some stuff in terms of some of the cases that's a little racier. Uh, it doesn't get too edgy in terms of that stuff. I, I would say the next movie has a little bit more of an edge in terms of what's right out in front, and I'll talk about that in a second. But um, So Counselor at Law, really solid stuff, really nice to see it get a... Uh, Blu-ray release. This is a brand new 2K Master, and this includes a commentary with Daniel Creamer and Catherine Weiler, um, <clears throat> who I believe is a relative of the deceased director, uh, which I'm very curious to check out. Uh, but yeah, very much enjoyed this back on the D DVD days, and hadn't seen it in probably 20 years, and it held up well. And it has a great ending, like. It's it's you know got some drama to it that where some stuff happens there's a potential incident near the end and then it sort of goes and I I love how it ends um, it really gets you leaning in and I, I love that about it so that's Counselor at Law and what that did for me was I was like looking at my old you know Kino Blu-rays and I was like I think I have another one with John Barrymore that I haven't seen and I pulled it out and it's called Topaz. Uh, from 1933, as well as, so this is the same year as Counselor at Law, and this one is directed by Harry uh, Dabadi uh, Darast. I don't know this director. Um, I didn't love this movie, I'll be honest. Uh, it's interesting, and there's a lot of neat things about it, not the least of which is that it stars not only John Barrymore, but Myrna Loy you know, favorite from the Thin Man series and, and beyond. Uh, it's a totally different character for Barrymore, so it's kind of fun and almost whiplash-inducing to watch it because he's just so um, direct and egomaniacal. Not, he's got a healthy ego, let's say, in Counselor at Law. Like, he's a guy who suffers no fools. And this, he plays a sort of lowly, nebbish professor who gets fired from the academy he's working at for flunking the child of, I think, the woman who, whose husband runs the academy. But the kid is a total screw-up and constantly um, making problems in class. And <clears throat> it sort of ties back into, if I had a million, actually, in a way. Um, but I won't go into how that happens. Uh, but so he gets fired and then is roped into a unbeknownst to him, a sort of a scheme by this other rich guy to put out this water called Topaz. He wants to market it and put it out. And he hires John Barrymore, who's a chemistry teacher, as his chief chemist to help develop the water. And Barrymore just loves it. His character is so excited and he develops the water. What he doesn't understand is that the water he's making, that he's refined to have like zero uh, you know, germs in it. Like they look under a microscope at regular water and it's like filled with bacteria and his stuff is like perfectly zero, like nothing. Um, and then he puts a litmus paper in regular water and it just basically almost dissolves the litmus paper and he puts it in his and it does nothing. So he's like, this is great. I've got my formula. But what does, he doesn't understand is that the amount of refining or whatever he's doing costs $40 a bottle to sell. So he can't, the guy, the rich guy can't sell that. So he sells what's basically this whole other um, crappy water with this guy's name on it. And he finds out about it and becomes this whole, <clears throat> this whole thing, um, eventually leading to some, some nice comeuppance. Uh, but it, like I said, it's a really neat thing to see John Barrymore so reserved and naive on the heels of watching something like counselor at law. Uh, but really needs to see Myrna Loy in this role. The other, the thing I was going to mention is that what's right out in front and, and I think makes this more of a pre-code movie is that, uh, we open with the rich guy at Myrna Loy's place or the place that he furnishes for her, I would assume. 
and he then realizes what time it is and rushes home to his wife. And he's having so he's having an affair with Myrtle Loy. She's his mistress, and it's right out in the open. And that is almost like a just glossed over, and it's not really a thing that I feel like in films post code it wouldn't have been so blatant in the same way. Maybe I'm wrong, but um, but of course, he's uh, the Barrymore character starts to take a liking to Myrtle Loy, and that becomes kind of a thing. And so it's it's a really sweet little movie, but like I said, I didn't dig it as much as uh, Counselor at Law or If I Had a Million, but I was like, oh, another pre-code with John Barrymore, a very different performance. Why not? So um, this one has commentary by Kat Ellinger, so that's cool. And... Uh, I don't know if it's a new scan or not, but it is written by Ben Hecht and Ben W. Levy. Uh, Hecht being one of the great screenwriters of this period. So it is pretty well written, I will say. Um, so another enjoyable one. And that's it for this round of classic films uh, here at Just the Dis. Uh, hopefully uh, there's some stuff in here for you to check out. Uh, this stuff is recommended. And uh, definitely go deeper on the Kino catalog with... The pre-code stuff. They've definitely done a ton of pre-code releases. Not as many as the noir stuff, but there's a lot of good stuff to be had, and I'll try and highlight some more of it as it continues to come out, I hope. Um, anyway, thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for listening, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.